Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, welcome to the second week of EMVS 110 Intro to Environmental Policy. So today what I want to talk about in a relatively short video, I want to keep this under 15 minutes, uh, is to basically go over one of the key concepts for the class, which is democracy. What does it look like in the abstract? And what is it supposed to look like in practice? So we're going to deal with two theories of how to define democracy uh, and what it should mean. Uh, and then we're going to look at four different ways in which the US tries to implement democracy. Uh, so the actual practice of democracy. And so at the end of this video, I'm hoping that you will have like uh, two different abstract yardsticks uh, to sort of measure democracy against, like you'll know what it should look like, um, so you'll know whether the US is living up to it or not, uh, and then you'll have like four um, like actual tangible ways that you can think about, okay, well this is how they're trying to do it. So you've got um, something to measure against and four things to measure. Um, yeah, so does that sound like a plan? Hopefully it does. So, uh, <clears throat> the reason that we're doing this is because um, in order to evaluate the outcome of a policymaking process, uh, in order to know whether the policy decision that's going to be implemented is actually going to solve the problems that we kind of looked at last week, uh, you need to know how it's happening. Um, so to figure out whether the policy decision that's being made is good or bad, um, knowing how they arrived at that uh, can be really useful. Um, we're taking policy really broadly, um, so any like collective decision, uh, the most important ones that we're going to look at would be the ones made by government, but really you can think of any group, even an unofficial club, uh, as having an environmental policy. If they're making collective decisions, uh, and those collective decisions are affecting the environment in some way, then that group has an environmental policy. So Knox College uh, has environmental policies. Uh, it makes collective decisions as an administration, as a community, and those decisions affect the environment. Uh, the ones we're going to look at are not the ones made by private actors, they're the ones made by public actors, so the official government. Uh, and this is just a picture of um, Nicolas Cage uh, stealing the US Constitution. Uh, Nicolas Cage movies actually have a lot to say about what's going on at the moment. Uh, the Wicker Man, he's in that movie, uh, and he says, killing me won't bring back your goddamn honey. Famous line from that movie, classic Nicolas Cage performance. What could be more relevant uh, to today's trade-off between human lives um, and the value of the stock market than Nicolas Cage teaching us that killing me won't bring back your goddamn honey. Uh, what was the other one? Oh yeah, Con Air. Have you seen Con Air? Um, in that movie, you know, uh, fuck COVID-19. John Malkovich in that movie is one of the best airborne viruses of all time. Uh, he plays Cyrus the virus uh, who hijacks an aeroplane. Anyway, that's Nicolas Cage. Also, one time I went to New Orleans and I was, um, I didn't actually pay to go on the like tour of cemeteries, um, but I was just like hovering in the background behind a tour group and the tour guide was saying that you can like, in the gothic cemeteries in New Orleans, you can still buy like plots, like if you want to be buried in, in those gothic cemeteries, you can still purchase a plot and be buried there. Um, but if you do, you have to make sure that your like grave site um, matches the gothic architecture. Um, and so if you buy a new plot, you have to still put like gargoyles on it and a sarcophagus and all the like proper gothic architecture so it fits with these like really old cemeteries. Um, except for one person who decided not to do that uh, and bought a plot and erected like a giant shining white pyramid. And so in the cemetery, you can kind of like, you're walking around, it's all like gothic stuff and um, gargoyles and whatnot. And then there's this one giant pristine white pyramid that towers above everything else. And it's, uh, that belongs to Nicolas Cage. 
um, and he wants to be buried there. Anyway, the US Constitution was where I was going. Anyway, okay, so we're evaluating policy outcomes. Um, knowing whether a policy is good or bad is really difficult to do uh, unless you know how it was created. So we're going to look at the ways that decisions get made in order to evaluate whether they were the right decision or not. Uh, democracy is a really useful yardstick for understanding how decisions get made. Uh, so in order to characterize a decision-making process as democratic, you can think about three criteria. So one way of thinking about democracy is to define it according to these three criteria. Limited, accountable, and representative decision-making. So uh, accountability means that you have to know who is responsible for a decision. If you don't know who is responsible for a decision, you can't hold them accountable and it can't be democratic. Somebody has to take responsibility and say, this was my decision. If there's no way to know who made the decision, you can't hold anyone accountable for it. That makes uh, elections really difficult. So elections are like this, um, this sort of mechanism of democracy. They're not really like, they're not in this definition yet, right? Um, but you can sort of implicitly see where elections come into this. Uh, without accountability, you can imagine that it would be difficult to have elections. Uh, representativeness is the other, like, uh, electoral component in this definition. So representation just means that um, whoever gets power uh, should be the, per the person who is more popular. So, if an idea is really popular in the popula in the popular in the population, yeah. If an idea is really widespread and a lot of people share it in the population, then that is the thing that should happen. That's the like basic idea of democracy. The person who wins the election should be the person who got the most votes. They should have the power to do what they want to do. Uh, so. If the person who is more popular doesn't win the election, or the idea that is more popular doesn't win the referendum, uh, or the thing that seems to be most widespread as a consensus among the group is not what the group ends up doing, then that group is probably not going to be characterised as democratic. So that's the basic idea of representation, and that is one of the core components of democracy. The thing that is more popular should be the thing that happens. That simple way of thinking about democracy is a really solid thing to go back to. Uh, was this policy the right policy? Well, did people agree with it? Because then, in a sense, right or wrong, it was decided democratically. So that's representation. Accountability is just once a decision is made, uh, you should know who is responsible for it, uh, because that allows you to um, get them out. It's like the reverse side of representation. Representation is the, the thing that is popular should be represented as the official group position. Uh, accountability means when the official group position turns out to be unpopular or is something that people don't want, then you should be able to change that official group position. You should be able to hold someone accountable for that. Limited uh, is the, the component of this definition that is kind of not like the other ones. It's sort of in tension with the other two. The idea of a limited policymaking process, a limited government, is that there are some things that, even if they're really popular, the government shouldn't be allowed to do them. Even if everyone in the group agrees that you should expropriate my property uh, or take my life, um, that shouldn't be allowed. Even if 99% of the people want arbitrary, um, like, arbitrary theft or arbitrary murder, that should never be the official group position. So democracy entails the protection of some rights that we see as basic and fundamental. A government that was totally representative, that any idea, as long as everyone wanted to do it, or 99% of the people wanted to do it, will do it, whatever it is. We might think of that as being super democratic, but we might also see it as like not fundamentally democratic. Um, 
And so this is where the tension is in the definitions. We want popular ideas to become the official group position. We also want the official group position to be uh, something that we know about, something that we can um, hold accountable. Uh, but we want some things to never become the official group position, even if they're really popular. So all of these three components are in, definition, are in tension, right? You can never be a perfect democracy. Democracy is not a destination, it is a process. As you become more representative, uh, it can be harder to maintain a limited government. As you become more accountable, it can be hard to stay representative. Uh, and as you try to become um, more limited, you might have to become less representative. So these are the three things that are in tension. And throughout the next eight weeks, you're going to be looking at a variety of policy decisions. And I want you to always be able to come back to these, this simple definition. Was it limited? Was it accountable? Was it representative? So hopefully that makes sense, but this is a good thing to like ask questions about um, and sort of game play it out in your head. The second way of thinking about democracy uh, is to uh, envision it as a circle. Um, and so you begin with opinions. Uh, the public wants something. Uh, they have preferences over policy. We assume that that is the case. People exist and they have opinions. Uh, if a democracy is working, there has to be some necessary connection between public opinion and public policy. Those two um, points on the circle have to be connected. So policy outcomes have to somehow reflect public opinion. That output has to be necessarily, so like legally, institutionally, um, guaranteed to be tied to the input. And the way that most democracies manage this uh, is through following the circle and using elections. So if you think of a relay race, the public is the original uh, principal mover of this system. They're the ones who begin with the baton. Uh, if the democracy is working well, then the outcome of an election should reflect public opinion. If the person who wins the election is not the most popular candidate, then you've got a failure of democracy. But if democracy is working well, the elected officials should uh, reflect public opinion. Then the elected officials tell the bureaucracy what to do. So members of Congress are not actually going out there and enforcing the law themselves. Those like 400 plus people are not the like EPA regulators inspecting water. They are not the um, state regulators inspecting factory conditions. They're not the police enforcing the laws. They're telling all of those bureaucrats, so bureaucrats doesn't just mean people um, doing administrative work in this context, it means anyone enforcing the law. Um, so elected officials have to have control of the bureaucracy. They have to be able to tell the bureaucracy uh, what to do. And so hopefully now you have the public telling the politicians what to do, the politicians telling the bureaucrats what to do, uh, and that's representation and accountability. Because the public can always get rid of the elected officials if democracy is working well. So the circle is kind of flowing uh, representation this way in the direction of the arrows. But accountability flows the other way. The bureaucrats have to be accountable to the elected officials. Like uh, if an elected official tells a bureaucrat to do something and the bureaucrat doesn't do it, under a democracy, the elected official should be able to hold that bureaucrat accountable. So the president, as an elected official, should be able to hire and fire people in their administration in order to make sure that the bureaucracy is going well. So we have the public, we have the elected officials, we have the bureaucrats, we'll have the judiciary sort of overseeing everything that the elected officials and the bureaucrats do. Uh, and then once all of those three branches of government, so the elected officials are the legislative branch, the bureaucrats are the executive branch, the judiciary is the judicial branch, um, you probably saw that coming. Uh, once all of those branches are working in tandem, you have a policy outcome. You have a state of the world that is realized as a result of the um, uh, preceding steps. That state of the world is judged by the public. The public then decides, should we vote for the incumbent and keep 
policy outcomes the way they are, or do we want some, is this actually like not quite reflecting our opinions? Do our prefer, are our preferences for something different? In which case we might vote for somebody else. So this definition, this way of thinking about democracy is not different than the, uh, than the other one. The other one is just saying a good democracy should be limited, accountable, and representative. Uh, this way of thinking about democracy just kind of shows you how those steps work. You have to have representation in the arrow that flows from public opinion to elected officials. And you have to have representation in the arrow that flows from elected officials to bureaucracy. Uh, if the elected officials, once they win election, do something that the public didn't want, that's a failure. If the bureaucrats refuse to obey the elected officials, that's a failure of democracy. If the judiciary says, actually, what the bureaucrats and the elected officials want to do, it's like, it's against the constitution, we can't do it. Uh, that might be a failure of representation too. Um, but it could also be a success of limitations on government. Uh, if the public aren't paying attention to policy outcomes, uh, they can't hold elected officials accountable. Um, if elected officials can't hold bureaucrats accountable, then things aren't going to be working well. So you do have, this definition in, is a way of thinking about uh, representation, accountability, and limits, but it's just a little bit more visual and a little bit more closely linked to what actually goes on. So um, the first way, the first definition is sort of abstract. It's not linked to like nation states uh, or to our contemporary circumstances. It's this abstract idea of what democracy is. Uh, this way of thinking about democracy is sort of a little bit more closely tied to the actual policy making process. It's a way of applying that first definition to the situation we find ourselves in. Um, but it's still, you know, you could apply this circle of democracy to New Zealand or to Canada, uh, France, Germany. Um, you can see how it applies to more authoritarian countries like North Korea, um, and you'll see where the failures are. Um, but it's just a little bit more tailored to nation states, I guess. Um, so this is why we have two ways of thinking about it. Our very top of the pyramid one, and then our one step down one. Um, so, if you have questions about the definition of democracy, let me know. Um, like, I've got a question. I'm not really sure what you mean. Could you, like, say a little bit more about, like, how how this works in practice, this may, those two ways of thinking about democracy may or may not uh, match up with what you think about when you're considering whether the United States is democratic. So uh, here we have two different like ways that people have implemented a, an actual empirical measurement scheme for the concept of democracy. Uh, and this is where the US uh, ranges on those measures. So the most widely used measure of democracy by comparative political scientists is probably what's called the polity scale. So the polity project measures democracy uh, with a, a strong emphasis uh, on the idea of representation and accountability, um, and I think it pays less attention to that third component of democracy, the idea that there should be limits. Um, so you'll see where the US scores on the uh, chart it hits a 10, the maximum on the democracy scale, right after the Civil War. Um, when there are still massive like uh, voting restrictions throughout the South on people of color, uh, particularly black people, uh, and when there are still, um, uh, women still don't have the vote. Um, and so to score the US as a 10 out of 10 for democracy without including those components maybe doesn't reflect um, people's lived experience of having their fundamental rights violated. Um, but, on the other hand, if you're looking for a measure of democracy that you can kind of use to gauge like where the whole world is on democracy um, over hundreds of years, you maybe don't want something that uh, focuses on that. Maybe you just want to get a sense of like, okay, compared to like feudal Europe, uh, and the level of democracy that they had there. When did the US start to be like fully democratic in the sense of like groups competing relatively peacefully over um, 
power. So when was at least like the limited group of people, the sort of homogenous group of property-owning white men, uh, when were they, like within that group, making decisions democratically um, without looking at like the uh, extent to which that homogenous group fully represented the very heterogeneous society. Uh, another interesting way to think about whether the US is democratic um, is to bear in mind that like, if you're designing a new constitution, why would you agree to a new constitution that gives you less power than the old constitution? So the US was never trying to be a perfect democracy. The people who were writing the constitution were trying to make sure that they wouldn't have like too much democracy, you know? Um, they were worried that the people would have like an inappropriate level of power. Um, you can think about democracy like, uh, or at least like, you, you can kind of imagine the way they were thinking about democracy being like tequila, you know, like one shot of tequila is like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. Two, was like, oh, all right, we're having a night like that. But three shots of tequila, you've kind of gone off the, it's like shuffleboard, you know, you want to get as close to the edge as possible, but if you go off the edge, nil point. Um, and so, you know, you have too much democracy, you can end up getting rid of some of the like limited ideas. Um, and so populism uh, is something that people think of as like democracy to excess. Um, so people just doing whatever is popular, even if it's like only popular for a second and is actually like a super bad idea. Um, so one of the sort of problems of democracy can be um, that we don't like always know how to measure those three components together and come up with an overall index of like, are you democratic? Uh, and also like recently the US uh, through phenomena like gerrymandering has actually become seen as like less democratic because it's harder to hold people accountable. Uh, there's also many other problems with democracy, um, but that's a few. Um, okay, so now I want to think about uh, how the US actually tries to implement democracy in its policymaking process. And I want to look at four institutions. So, the first is the voting system. This is really fundamental. Perhaps the key link between um, in the sort of circle of democracy is the first one, uh, how the public is asked for its opinion. Public opinion is like the fundamental driver of democracy, you know? Um, but when you think about how to measure that, it's actually really difficult. People have, like, there's millions of issues, right? There's like, uh, what kind of, there's all the different environmental issues that we, that we could think about, like what's your opinion on uh, water quality? What's your opinion on air quality? What's your opinion on climate change? Public opinion has like millions of dimensions, even when we just think about environmental policy. And then think about all the other types of policy. Uh, what do you think about like Medicare for all? Uh, what do you think about um, nuclear disarmament? Uh, what do you think about free trade? Uh, what do you think about the death penalty? Um, so, if you wanted to measure what does the US public think, you would have to ask them millions of questions. Because there's millions of different things that you can have an opinion on. And then, you need to do that for all people in the US. So you have to ask millions of people each millions of questions. So then you've got a spreadsheet with like millions and millions of rows and millions and millions of columns. Uh, and when you think about that as just an engineering problem, just as a mathematical problem, that's like an almost infinite amount of variation. How could you ever take that spreadsheet uh, and come up with a, a single government budget that accurately represented all of that information? It's mathematically impossible. The deeper you get into this, uh, you start to think about, uh, oh, there's a discipline, a sub-discipline really called social choice. Uh, which is basically attacking the problem of democracy with mathematical tools. Uh, how do you figure out what the best thing to do is? Um, and the results from that sub-discipline are that there's really no mathematically accurate way to do it, which shouldn't really surprise us. 
Um, this is why social science is like perpetually interesting. There's never going to be like a full democracy. We will never get there, which I guess is like you know kind of okay because like I like to think that, that, that like we would have figured it out by now if it was possible to figure out. You know, this is like a really fundamental problem. How do we live together? Um, and like, if there was an actual solution, if there really was like a factual best way um, to take millions of different opinions and amalgamate them into one group decision, if there was truth out there, I like to think we would have found it by now. And so it's kind of reassuring to have like mathematical proofs saying, no, there is no truth out there. There's no best democracy. We are always going to fight about this. Um, because there's no answer that's going to keep everyone happy. Um, every decision will have winners and losers. And so we're always going to have to work. Um, and there will always be a role for like trying to get better at this, uh, which I think is kind of um, encouraging. Because it means we can always do better. There's always room to improve. And that means there's, there's, there's always a point to trying to like make a difference because you can always go. anyway you know what I mean. Uh, so elections are like this fundamental part, right? <laughs> this video is not going to be fifteen minutes. Uh, okay, so um, you've got uh, elections. Um, the way the U.S. has decided to implement its elections is to emphasize accountability and reduce representation. And so there's lots of different ways that you can run an election. Um, uh, none of them are perfect. None of them will ever accurately reflect the true complexity of the spreadsheet. Um, but one of the ways that you can do it is by saying, OK, well, if a candidate gets like 10% of the vote, we'll give them 10% of the governmental power. That's called a proportional representation system. And it's seen as the most representative system. Uh, if, like, if there are 10 different policy possibilities, you might have 10 different candidates representing those 10 different possibilities. If each of them gets 10% of the vote, and then you give each of them 10% of the power, then you have 10 people, each of whom has 10% of the power, and they have to come up with a group decision. And by allowing everybody into the room where that decision is made, uh, you give everyone a chance to like influence the outcome. It's very representative. Um, the US doesn't do that. The person who gets 50% of the vote plus one gets 100% of the power. A member of Congress can ignore 49% of their district as long as they know they can count on 51%. It's always really clear who your member of Congress is, so you can always hold them accountable, and if they do something that you don't like, you can always vote them out of office. There's only one of them. If it was that council of 10, you might not know, okay, so, so something went wrong. Uh, let's say you wanna hold the council of 10 accountable and make sure you get a new council of 10 next time. But you'll never really know who said what in that room or who is responsible for the eventual group decision. If there's only one person in charge, accountability is really high. But there's a possibility that 49% of the vote is just being ignored, so representation is low. Um, so knowing that the US has gone high on accountability but low on representation uh, is a good way of thinking about environmental policy. So um, if environmental policy is one of those issues that often gets ignored, uh, then living in a not very representative system is going to make that problem a lot worse. And so this is, our, this is sort of how we're going to connect these abstract ideas of democracy to the actual like, environmental problems that we see around us. The second really important um, way that the US does things, uh, the way that the US tries to implement democracy, is through presidentialism. So uh, in lots of countries around the world, there's no president. Instead, you take all the powers that the president would have and you give them to the equivalent of the Speaker of the House. So whoever wins a majority in the US House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House, currently Nancy Pelosi, would have all the powers of the president. And so what that means is it becomes a lot more important to win a majority of the House because there's no presidential election. Uh, instead, 
whoever has a majority in the House gets all of that power. Uh, by splitting those powers and having a separate presidential election, uh, you reduce the need for party discipline. So the president, right now, doesn't have a majority in the House of Representatives, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, they're still the president. Uh, and so they don't necessarily need the support of their party as long as they can be personally popular. Uh, and so that means that they can assemble like a coalition of people um, that doesn't have to be quite as broad. Um, they can win a majority of the electoral college and not bring the majority of the country along with them, uh, but it doesn't really matter. It's, they still get power at the end of the day. Uh, and so that tends to, again, improve accountability. It's really clear who the president is and they will get blamed for things. Um, but it's less representative, you know? Um, in a parliamentary system, so where there is no president and the Speaker of the House has all the powers, um, it, the party tends to be a lot more unified and a lot more disciplined. So party unit, like people think of the US as being like a polarized system with two really different um, and quite homogenous parties. There aren't many left-wing Republicans and there aren't many right-wing Democrats. And that's, you know, true in a sense. But if you look around the world, a lot of other countries actually have, like, much more distinct parties than the US. Um, so you may think you live in a polarized system, and you certainly, by comparison to US history, live in a relatively polarized time. Um, but that's not likely to be uh, a permanent feature uh, of US discourse. And for most of US history, the parties have actually been closer together, um, and partially that's a feature of presidentialism. And so even though now you're living in a polarized time, presidentialism is still working behind the scenes. Uh, and so um, there's likely to be um, some kind of change in the future. Like current polarization is sort of greater than we would expect given the underlying institutions of the US. And so um, either those institutions have to change uh, or that degree of polarization is likely to change. Um, at least that's, that's how I would interpret the situation. Anyway, so presidentialism matters. It, it increases accountability, it reduces representation. Uh, so federalism uh, is the third institution that we're going to look at a lot during this course uh, as an example of how the policymaking process is structured um, to produce outcomes that are like uh, you know, either more or less democratic. Um, so presidentialism, uh, so federalism, sorry, is just the idea that there has to be at least two levels of government, and each of them has to have final say over at least one policy area. So in a country that's non-federal, so unitary, um, the, the central government has final say over all policies. Like, you will still have, like, a local mayor uh, or, like, a regional council or something, but they can always be overruled on everything um, by the central government. Federalism just says, you know, there are some things that we don't allow the central government to overrule the local government on. Uh, so in the original US Constitution, anything that wasn't explicitly given to the central government was retained by the states uh, as their jurisdiction. Uh, this was, so federalism is often like, not something that people choose because they think it's good for democracy, but it's like a short-term constitutional expediency to deal with an external threat. So, uh, in the case of the United States, federalism was a response to the threat from, you know, I'm just going to say it, Britain. But we don't, you know, we're all over it by now. Um, so... Uh, federalism is kind of like this holdover from an original, like something that was a big issue 200 years ago, uh, but now much less so. Uh, but it still carries on and it still has influences on uh, environmental policy. Uh, it tends to um, improve like uh, representation uh, because it's less likely that a central government will sort of overrule a minority opinion. Um, so it allows policy to be more tailored 
to individual uh, states, right? If you have 50 different states that can all do their own different things, that can improve representation. Um, but it can also like reduce accountability. Uh, so this is one of the ways in which the US has kind of like um, tried to balance out uh, its very accountable but less representative institutions with another institution that sort of improves representation but reduces accountability. An interesting thing to think about here um, is whether this is good or bad for policy. Um, so do states work together uh, in order to represent their citizens or do they compete with each other? So recently we've seen states bidding against each other for uh, personal protective equipment to deal with the pandemic. Um, this is an example of federalism sort of working maybe to the detriment um, of some citizens. But either way, it's a really important structuring dynamic for how democratic policymaking works in the US. So we need to know what federalism is. And that's why we'll do um, so many days on each of these four institutions. Uh, the final one we're gonna think about in this course is the separation of powers. So you have your legislative, you have your executive, you have your judicial branch, and they each have separate like ways of um, gaining power. So you have separate elections for the president and separate uh, elections for the House and the Senate. So the legislative branch is separated from the executive branch. Um, they cannot um, get rid of each other, right? Uh, in a parliamentary system, if, the, if there's a no confidence vote in the speaker, that has to be, uh, you know, 99% of the time there has to be an election. Um, because if you don't have a majority in the House, you can't be the speaker. So you can't be the prime minister, uh, which is what we would call the combined speaker president role. Um, so the prime minister would have to resign if they lost the support of the legislature. Uh, the president doesn't have to resign if they lose the support of the legislature. They have separated powers. Uh, this encourages compromise and so perhaps encourages representation, but reduces accountability. Um, the judicial branch uh, is supposed to act as a check uh, and balance on the other two branches. They're supposed to enforce this idea that democracy has limits. So uh, this is like the classic like way of explaining what the judicial branch does and why you want it uh, is the Greek uh, Orpheus, Odysseus, Othello, no, not Othello. Either Orpheus and or Odysseus uh, was tied to the mast, right? Um, so they tied their own, they were like the side, I'm gonna make this up, aren't I? Hopefully one of you is like a, a classics major or minor, um, and you can explain this in the Google Classroom. Um, but it basically is a story about a person who like wants to listen to this song, but the song slaps so hard that like um, you uh, are drawn towards it inexorably uh, and you end up like crashing into rocks. Uh, and then the people making the music eat you, I think. So like anytime you hear the song, you're drawn towards it, even if it kills you. And so this dude um, who I think was, we'll call him O, um, he was like, I want to hear the song, but obviously, like, I don't want to die. So is there a way for me to hear it, but, like, not end up running uncontrollably towards it and crashing? Uh, and so he gets all of his, like, crew to put earplugs in uh, or AirPods. Um, and, uh, and then he ties his hands behind the mast and takes his AirPods out. And then um, all of his crew are like steering the ship and they can't hear the, the, the music, but he gets to hear it. Um, and he's telling them like, oh my God, it, no, it's, it's even more amazing than I thought. Like we've got to go towards where the music's coming from, but his hands are behind the mast, you know? Um, so they don't, that, so he gets to hear it and he doesn't end up crashing his ship into the rocks. This is probably what it sounded like when Orpheus didn't crash his ship into the rocks and he heard what it sounded like. I just wanted to see if anyone was actually still watching this video. Crushed it.
amazing storytelling. Um, the other, like, the way I'm more familiar with thinking about it is, um, like, the, the Harry Potter one, where, um, uh, Dumbledore is like, um, I'm gonna drink this, um, uh, uh, this potion or whatever, and probably when I start drinking it, I'm gonna change my mind and be like, I don't want to drink this anymore, and it's your job to keep me drinking it, even if I ask you to stop. Uh, and so Harry is like, okay. Um, and so he's like the Supreme Court in this example, and Dumbledore is like the legislature. So the idea of having a judicial branch is to say, like, look, I'm going to set up this system whereby I'm going to do whatever the people tell me, right? But here is a list of ten things that, like, even if the people tell me to do them, you have to stop me, right? So we're going to put a limit on the degree of representation that we actually want. So if you're worried that, like, I don't know if you've met, like, the public, but the public suck. The public, like, you know, they voted for the Nazis, uh, they voted for Coldplay, um, not to, like, equate those two, um, but, you know what I mean, like, People's Choice Awards winners sometimes are awful. Um, so just because something's popular doesn't mean it's good, um, is what I'm saying. And so having a judicial branch to be like, look, I know you think this is popular right now, but, like, it's terrible. Like, don't eat the Tide Pods. Um, that can be really uh, useful um, as like a check on democracy. So sometimes if the government says like, you know, I actually think we should uh, like drill for oil everywhere, um, if it violates something that you think is on the, the top 10 like list of things that we can't violate, then having a judicial branch to step in there and be like, you remember when you said like, stop me if I do this, like, you're doing this. So I'm going to stop you. Of course, the problem with having a judicial branch is like uh, what happened in the New Deal in the 1930s, uh, where something really was popular, but the judicial branch was interpreting the Constitution in such a way as to say, like, actually, I don't think this is constitutional, even though it was, like, massively popular. And so they were, um, you know, so if you give your phone to your friend and you're like, no matter how drunk I get tonight, don't give me my phone, I don't want to text that person. Um, that might be a really good idea, you know? Uh, but then what if, like, two drinks in, you actually really do need your phone for something else? And they're like, you said I couldn't give you your phone back. And you're like, no, the situation has changed. I actually really need my phone. This is an emergency. I just want to text them, hey. Uh, and your friend is like, no. Um, you know, what if it was a real, like, and you really did need it? So having a judicial branch, having that, like, dad friend, um, sometimes it's good, but maybe sometimes it's bad. Anyway, these are the four ways in which democracy, democracy um, actually, tangibly, I can bring it to you on a plate, structures policy making in the US. So, um, as we fulfill the goals of the class, as we figure out, like, what, how does policy making work? Who is likely to win? Uh, and how can I change that? Um, these are the four institutions where if you know them inside out and you know how they actually work, um, you can kind of figure out, okay, well, look, okay, this person is represented here, uh, but they don't have power over this. Um, these are the people electing this particularly powerful individual. That's how you can start to figure out, like, how does policymaking actually work? Um, what, what does the public think? So, so this is why we're learning about all of this. Uh, so, the final thing that I wanted to say um, is a slightly different perspective on democracy uh, from Angela Davis, uh, who wrote this book, Abolition Democracy. Um, and so what she's saying is that if you want to change the way democracy works, if you're like, okay, this group, um, because of the way democracy was designed 200 years ago, the like 10 fucking people who live in Wyoming have as many senators as the, like, tens of millions of people who live in California. I'm like, how is that democratic? One group is being massively overrepresented, and one group is being massively underrepresented. So, from a perspective of thinking about democracy, like, how does that make sense? And so her argument is that if you want to change the outcome of democracy, don't just try and win an election. 
change the way elections are run and you will influence not just the decision that you care about now, but all future decisions for all coming time. Changing the rules of the game is so much more powerful than just winning the game once. Uh, whoever you want to be the president in November, they're going to have to operate within the system that we're studying now. And that system puts massive limits on what even one person can do. And so unless the constitution changes, the same groups are going to be overrepresented and the same groups are going to have their voices silenced. She also argues that it's not just enough to change the institutions to something more representative, more democratic, more authentically, sincerely representative of the massively heterogeneous US society that you live in. It's not just enough to, to, to change those institutions. You have to change them in such a way that doesn't just get rid of what was happening before, but that like um, incorporates what was that like um, compensates for what was happening before. It's not enough to just create a level playing field after hundreds of years of the le of the playing field not being level. You have to then also like allow people to take advantage of the level playing field by making up for what happened in the past. So as we think about is the US democratic? Is environmental policy making being done in a democratic way? Are we representing people's true opinions about this? Are we able to hold accountable decision makers who do things that are not good for the environment? And do we have a good idea about what the limits are? Uh, of what we should be able to do on the environment. As we think about all of those things, and it's, it's really important to bear in mind that like the perfect set of institutions is not going to be the same for every society. And a set of institutions that was more representative, better on democracy, however you think about it, like more, maybe you care more about accountability or you care more about limits or you care more about representation, whatever you think, you have to factor in the importance of the trajectory of history up until that point. Um, and so just thinking about democracy in the abstract is not going to um, fully solve the problems that we want to solve. And so we have to think about um, the history of how we got to the current democracy. Uh, and so I think that is a really important corrective to political theorists who kind of harken back to like Athenian like pseudo-democracy as if that was the template that we ought to be going for. Like, we have to think about what democracy is going to work for this historical moment. Um, and so that is, I think, an important like, thing to think about. Anyway. Um, okay. So, uh, institutions structure democracy. Uh, institutions matter. That's why we're not just studying polls uh, or what people think. I want to know how do we get from what people uh, say that they think or what they say their preferences are to what actually happens. And that's about studying the rules of the game, right? Um, and so that's where we're going to go from here. So we're going to learn more about all four of those institutions and talk about how they actually structure US policymaking and how we get from public opinion, what's in all of our heads, to like what we see in the world around us. So anyway, uh, my apologies for making a video that went over what I wanted to do in terms of time. But I hope you're doing well. Cheerio.